In today's video, my friends and I enter the world of Pokemon. My goals are simple, capture Pokemon, train them to be strong, and above all else, we have to beat our rival, because every Pokemon trainer has to have a rival. Whoever wins gets to battle my brother Ethan, who was also racing to become the ultimate Pokemon champion. Join us as we strive to be the very best in the mod pack, Pixelmon Reforged. Hey you! Do you want to play mod packs? Do you want to play them with friends? Single player gets pretty lonely, huh? Then head on over to Bisect Hosting, a great place with great prices for all your server hosting needs. They support so many mod packs that I have yet to find one that they don't. Use code DOUBLESAL at checkout for 25% off your first order. Bisect Hosting, a great site for great servers. Because hanging out with pigs, it gets pretty old. You ever go to an ice cream parlor and just get smacked in the face with all the potential flavors you can get? That's how I feel when I pick a starter Pokemon. To save myself the trouble, I'm just gonna pick this chicken nugget looking one. Now every Pokemon trainer needs a rival, so in this video we're gonna choose Quinton to be our rival. And following the time-honored tradition of Pokemon, Quinton decided to pick the exact type opposite of mine. With our brand new Pokepals right by our side, it was time to test the strength of our friendship and have them battle to the death. May the better Pokemon win. Maybe battling isn't for me. You see, I'm much more of a builder than a battler. But in the world of Pokemon, you don't have that choice. You can't be homeless either. So I decided to build a nice little cottage on the river. I had no one to call my neighbor. And together we built a nice little community where we could raise our Pokemon to be nice and strong. Torchic waited in the rain. If he was gonna beat that Mudkip, then he needed a resistance to water. Now that we had our houses, the next thing we had to build was a Pokemon team. As for Ethan, his Pokemon journey was just beginning. This man looked out because he spawned in the middle of a town. With the shopkeeper nearby, Ethan was able to make money. All he had to do was find some loot in the nearby chests. There was a lot of it. Then he went back and resold it to the shopkeeper. It's a pretty good way to make a quick buck. And Pokemon, you are going to need a lot of money. There was even a Pokemon Center nearby, perfect for healing your Pokemon after every battle. Ethan continued to stroll around the village, taking in all the sights, including the statue of some unknown Pokemon. I'm more of a Gen 1-er, so I don't really know what half these Pokemon are called. After that, he did a little break in and entering, taking anything he could get his hands on. Even the senior citizens weren't safe from Ethan's greed. After that, Ethan used his Fire Monkey to stomp on a bug, and then it leveled up. With Monferno by his side, Ethan was ready to take on anything the world could throw at him. Little did he know that on a different server, his greatest threat was already training. If he was going to be the very best, Torchic had to put in the work. Although I wasn't expected to get Pokemon meat after every battle. The team needed to grow, and if we were going to win, we needed variety. I caught a Mankey, and with his help, we were able to get this little seahorse on our team. It was a strange looking battle, but eventually Mankey pulled through. After that, the trio and I set off searching for more allies. Like this Machop. Sorry Mankey, but it looks like you're going to be replaced. Poor Torchic took a beating, but even this Machop wasn't strong enough to withstand the power of a Pokeball. With one toss, that Machop was finally ours. For every capture, Torchic gained more and more XP. Not only that, but for every level he was also learning new moves. I then ran into Quentin at the Pokemon Center. Uh, he's just standing there. Menacingly! I made sure to heal my Pokemon, then after that, I got out of there ASAP. Once we were done, the team and I went back into the wild. Luckily, we came across this Bulbasaur, and when I say luckily, I mean it was lucky for the Bulbasaur because who picks Bulbasaur? With the addition of Gen 1's worst starter, all we needed was one more member on our team. As for Ethan, well, he was on the hunt as well. He was stalking an Abra, and for good reason. If you get too close to this Pokemon, then they have a habit of teleporting away. After capturing himself an Abra, he then made his way to a swamp and caught a Toxel. His team was finally coming together. The sun set, and he then found himself taking cover in a village for the night. It was a decent sized village, so instead of going to sleep, he decided to explore. And that's when he came across this massive building. I'm pretty sure this was a giant greenhouse. But there were more than just plants inside. It turns out that the greenhouse was actually a base for Pokemon trainers. And these trainers were way stronger than Ethan. Even though he had the type advantage with his Monferno, these grass types were still strong enough to overpower him. Poor little Abra didn't even stand a chance. After his defeat, Ethan left the greenhouse. His entire team had been wiped, and he needed a place to heal him. After healing his Pokemon, Ethan went back outside, and 
was greeted with a strange creature. It was a shiny Bibberol. Bibberol? I don't know how to pronounce it, but Bidoof was always better. Even though he had a goofy appearance, this Pokemon was not to be underestimated. One by one, each Pokemon fell until the entire team found themselves back at the Pokemon Center. After taking advantage of the Pokemon World's healthcare system, Ethan found himself back outside trying to capture the Bibberol again. Only this time, he was successful. Would Bibberol become a friend, or would he remain a beast that needed to be tamed? <laughs> we'll never know. He went straight into the PC. Now, for some reason, Christmas came early to the Pokemon world. I don't know what the relation is between this Christmas biome and Pixelmon, but for some reason it's there, and I'm not complaining because who doesn't love Christmas? Speaking of Christmas, I was able to receive one of the greatest gifts a Pokemon trainer could ever receive. I'm not talking about the gross Clefairy, I'm talking about something else. Torchic and I encountered a Larvitar! Now, I know this thing is an investment, but I think this was gonna be worth it. After wasting a few Pokeballs, we were finally able to add him to our team, and at last, we were complete. At least that was the case until I saw a Beldum on my map. After that, I knew someone on the team was gonna be axed. This is it. This is my, this is my go-to. Over 600, like, <laughs> No! Well, I guess John didn't get the Pokemon. I did not mean to do what I just did, but you know what, it happens. Luckily for us, we got a second chance. This thing ate up so many of my Pokeballs, so it better have been worth it. While I was struggling, Ethan was frolicking through the flowers, having the time of his life. Enjoying his carefree existence, Ethan explored a number of places, including the ocean where he came across a submarine. He poked around, trying to find a way inside, until he just decided to break through the glass. I mean, why make your job harder than it needs to be? Now, the inside of the submarine was pretty small, and there wasn't a lot to look at. As for the barrel on the back, nothing special, just fish. He kept sailing until he came across land, and after that he broke his boat and prepared for the next leg of his adventure. It was time to explore the Badlands, and boy was that exploration worth it, because shortly after, Ethan came across a Scyther. With Abra's help, capturing the Scyther was a breeze, and after that, Abra actually evolved. Little Abra was all grown up, because now, he was Kadabra. Not only did Ethan have two evolved Pokemon on his team, but also, he had a new Pokemon that he could actually ride. Scyther was going to be an amazing asset to Ethan's team. The next morning, it was back to exploring. After wandering through the desert, Ethan stumbled across a desert temple. Without any tools, Ethan decided to break through the floor with his hands, like a caveman. He then carefully descended into the pit, taking every precaution not to set off the TNT trap at the bottom. A little bread munching break was had, and then the chests were looted. As for the contents inside, he found some pretty good stuff, including fire gems, some iron, he even found a GS ball, and hey, he even found a diamond. With nothing left in the chests, it was time to take off, so he stacked out of the hole and ran out of the temple. After that, he took refuge at a Pokestop. The loot in the area wasn't that good. Pokemon stuff had some pretty average items that Ethan didn't need, seeing as how his inventory was already full. After that, he went to go take a look inside the tent, and it was the same case, although I think he did keep the food. The sun was beginning to set, and once again he found himself in another village. There he found himself some potions, helpful items that can be used to heal your Pokemon, so you can believe he took those. While wandering through the desert at night, Ethan came across a Gibble, a little Pokemon that had a lot of potential. This little Pokemon packed quite a punch. With Toxel fainted, Monferno was up to bat. Thankfully, the Fire Monkey was up to the task. He did a lot of damage to this Gibble, and as a result of that, Ethan was able to capture him with ease. In the morning, Ethan decided to celebrate the capturing of Gibble. So, for some reason, he decided to go into a Pokemon Center and start taking photos of the locals. Like this guy, Ipamura. They ended up becoming lifelong friends. I don't know what the story is, but he's gonna be in the video from here on out. Now, I guess I'm getting old because there are a lot of new things in Pixelmon that weren't there last time I played, one of them being raid battles. Now, if you don't know what a raid battle is, it's when four Pokemon decide to take on a massive Pokemon. That one Pokemon is huge and it's super strong. Today's challenger was Exploud. On the opposite side, we had the lineup of Kadabra, Combusken, Clefairy, and Snorlax. Well, the battle didn't go as planned. Clefairy instantly fainted, as did Kadabra, and the other two didn't last that much long after either. After suffering a humiliating defeat, Ethan had to retreat, and he chose to go towards these ruins in the distance. Now this was a strange place. It wasn't like your average desert temple or your average jungle temple. These ruins were much bigger. Not only that, but these ruins were being occupied by Team Galactic. They're basically the bad guys from another Pokemon game. He didn't want any trouble, so he just kept walking right past them. 
even decided to loot some of their chests, but there wasn't anything good inside. Eventually, he just decided to suck it up, go in front of one of the members, and loot their armor stand right in front of him. He also found himself a stunning pair of boots. He found himself a second wind, so he attempted another raid battle, and this time, he actually won. If you win a raid battle, you get a lot of loot. He even came across a Larvitar, which would become the sixth member of his team. The next day, Ethan saw something that would blow his mind. It was the legendary Pokemon Rayquaza. Ethan tried his best to throw the Pokeball as far as he could, but it looks like Rayquaza was too far away. Regardless, this Pokemon was too good to pass, so he followed him for a while, hoping that he would descend eventually, but he didn't. After that, Ethan needed to evolve his Kadabra, and the only way to do that was to trade him with another player. That's where Ipamura came in. Once the trade was complete, so was Kadabra's evolution process. He slowly morphed into the final form, Alakazam. Now all Ethan had to do was get his Pokemon back from Ipamura. But, it looks like cooperation was going to be a little difficult. Once he got Alakazam back, it was back to exploring. And it didn't take long before Ethan came across another structure. This one being some type of jungle ruin. At the bottom of the staircase, Ethan found what looked like a puzzle room. And in the center of the room, there was a master ball. Although you can't actually keep the master ball, they do contain items. Ethan pressed buttons, flipped levers, he even tried breaking through the wall. Unfortunately, he couldn't uncover the secrets of this underground area. After a few tries, he decided to pack up and move on. And it wasn't long after until he found another set of ruins. This one being what looked like a haunted house. In the center of the house was a staircase. He climbed only to find Ipamura, but no loot. Once again, another Pixelmon structure found a way to waste Ethan's time. There's so many structures, but there's just no loot in them. He took to the seas and came across what looked like a fishing boat. Hopefully there was loot in this one. He circled around until he found a way to get inside. Once he was on the boat, he began exploring, hoping to find something of value. There was a fisherman and a lifeboat, and other than that, it was a pretty nice boat. Ethan walked around, carefully searching each cabin he came across, and thankfully, some of the cabins did have something of value. After exploring every area of the ship, the only thing that would make this trip complete was to do the one thing you always do on a fishing boat, and that is fish. But even with the help of a super rod, Ethan wasn't catching anything, so he needed to move to a place where the fish were actually biting. He ditched the fishing boat and sailed towards the middle of the ocean. He once again cast the line into the water, hoping to catch something good. And boy, did he catch something. Not long after, he caught a Gyarados on his line. And even though Gyarados was one of the most intimidating Pokemon out there, somehow Ethan was able to capture it on his first try. And the best part was that after capturing Gyarados, Ethan didn't even need his boat anymore. Thanks to Gyarados, Ethan was going to be cutting through the waves in style. Now that is the way to travel. With Gyarados added to his arsenal, Ethan was ready to terrorize the Seven Seas, and he was going to begin by raiding the submarine. Now this one was bigger than the last one, and there were actually people on the inside. Team Rocket Grunts to be exact. As soon as they saw Ethan, they challenged him to a battle. Unfortunately, it didn't matter how big Gyarados was, he was no match for the Team Rocket Grunt's Pokemon. Not only was Gyarados down, but so were the rest of Ethan's Pokemon. So, there was only one thing left to do, it was time to perform a tactical retreat. For the next few days, Ethan would continue to explore. But back in the other world, I was training my Torchic, and all of his hard work was finally paying off. At this point, he had finally evolved into a Combuskin. My Beldum was now a Matang, and my Bulbasaur was actually an Ivysaur. Good for him. The grind didn't stop, and Combuskin spared no one, not even his fellow birds. For a kid's game, I think it's a little dark that you can actually tear the beaks off of some Pokemon and keep them as items. For training sessions, we came across some of the newer Pokemon, some of the weirder Pokemon. Why does he look like that? Speaking of weird, this Pidgey was purple. Now, I know what a shiny Pokemon is, but I just never understood the appeal. But hey, a rare Pokemon is a rare Pokemon, and if he was worth something, I wasn't gonna let him slip away. Thank God he was level 2, because he was incredibly easy to catch. After betraying another bird, Combuskin felt bad, so he needed to atone for his sins. Luckily for him, we came across what was a Pokemon church. After getting his worship on, we came across another Pokemon, this time a Pikachu who looked like he had been in the sun too long. Now, it was at this point that I discovered there was a way faster way to level up, and some of you may call me out on this, but come on, if the server offers it, I think it's only fair that I use it, and that was that I could level him up at the training center. Each section of the training center was divided into different parts, 
parts where you could level up their defense, their attack, their special attack, whatever it was you needed upgraded, the training center could provide. Although I did feel bad because the Pokemon we were training against, they never put up a fight. They were just there to be punching bags. My patience paid off because eventually Combusken evolved into Blaziken, the final form of Torchic. Not only that, the entire team was evolving. Machop evolved into Machoke, and we also got Piplup to evolve into Prinlup. Now when did we catch him? Eh, off camera. Quinton also found out about the area, so he began evolving his Pokemon too. With both of our teams leveled up since our last encounter, it was time for a rematch. But just like when you battle a gym leader, you can't go straight to the main event. You have to battle the grunts. In this case, we had to take on Noah. I'm not gonna lie, the battle did not last that long. But I don't think it was fair because Noah didn't even have a full team, so he was at a disadvantage. But at the end of the day, victory is victory. His Pokemon tried his best, but not good enough. After the battle with Noah, which was basically a warm-up, I had to heal my Pokemon before taking on the main challenger, Quinton. It was time for round two. The battle began with the one-on-one -on -one with my Blaziken versus Quinton's Toxtricity. Now I was at a huge disadvantage because I had never seen that Pokemon before. I don't know what type he was and the only thing I had to work with was his name. I'm guessing that he was Poison Electric? As soon as I thought I had that Pokemon figured out, he swapped Toxtricity for Swampert. Blaziken is fire, Swampert is water. Do the math. I was at a disadvantage so I had to swap him out. I could have used Ivysaur, but he wasn't fully evolved yet, and Swampert was, so instead I decided to use Primplup. He wasn't fully evolved either, but I needed to save Ivysaur as a last resort. And just as I predicted, Swampert, because he was fully evolved, he stomped Primplup. That was an uphill battle that could not be won, so we sent out Ivysaur, and unfortunately Ivysaur wasn't strong enough. I know Swampert's only three more levels higher than Ivysaur, but come on! It's as if type advantages didn't even exist anymore. After that, we sent out our investment Pokemon, Larvitar, which had evolved into a Pupitar, and man, did he do damage. But once again, Swampert slaughtered another one of my Pokemon. After that, it was time to test out Matang to see what he could do. Up until this point, we had never battled with him, so thank God he was able to knock Swampert off. But we weren't done yet. Quinton sent out another Pokemon I had never seen before. Now, I know Teddy Ursa, and I know Ursa Ring, but what's Ursa Luna? The battle was neck and neck, and at this point, it was only a matter of speed. Who was faster? Even though Ursaluna had 4.4% health left, he still killed Matang. We sent our trusty Machoke out to finish the job, and thankfully, Ursaluna was defeated. But Quinton still had way too many Pokemon left, including a Gyarados. Machoke was a dead man. Quinton withdrew Gyarados, and I sent out Blaziken. It was time for Blaziken to face Kadabra. That was one of the easier battles. After Kadabra, it was time to face Haunter, but by this point, Blaziken was hanging by a thread. Thankfully, Haunter was easy to take care of, and at the end of the battle, Blaziken was once again faced with his first foe, Toxtricity. With full health, might I add. At this point, I was just wishing I had a potion. Blaziken was killed, and all we had left was Primplup, the penguin guy. He died. No surprise there. For the second time, we lost to Quinton. There was something seriously wrong with my team, and it had to be fixed. While I was reevaluating my training methods, Ethan's team was only getting stronger and stronger. The next stop on their adventure was this church and this graveyard. In typical Minecraft fashion, Ethan left no block unturned. Since we last saw them, some of Ethan's Pokemon actually evolved. His Scyther was now a Scissor, and his Gibble was now a Cabite. Using Scissor to fly around, Ethan was able to cover way more ground at a much faster pace. After flying for hours, Ethan came across what looked like Santa's workshop. He carefully descended to the ground, hoping that one of these buildings would contain something worth taking. In the typical breaking and entering fashion, Ethan decided to get inside one of the buildings by crawling through a window. On the other side of the wall was the living room of someone's holiday home. On the second floor, there were some chests with Pokeballs, but other than that, it was time to move on. Leaping from building to tree branch, Ethan carefully descended to the bottom. He walked to the ledge of a small cliff and saw an even bigger building. After plummeting to the ground, Ethan realized that he hit the jackpot. This wasn't a house, this was Santa's workshop. Like a kid on Christmas morning, Ethan rode around his brand new bike. But there was still work to be done. So, Ethan decided to part ways with Santa's workshop and move on. It was time to train some more. The more levels his Pokemon gained, the more XP it took for them to evolve. After a lot of training, his Toxel evolved into a Toxtricity. His Gabite had also evolved into a Garchomp. Speaking of Garchomp, when flying around, Ethan actually discovered a portal in the sky. 
was some type of weird wormhole, and he decided to fly in only to be teleported to a different realm. This must be some type of Pokemon dimension that I'm not familiar with, but this place was strange. First off, the gravity in this world was way off. You could jump extremely high and fall super slow. Second, there were some areas that were super bright. I mean, I'm talking about blindingly bright. And then there were other areas that were just pitch black. It's as if night and day were happening simultaneously in this world. Excited to explore uncharted territory, Ethan hopped around without the fear of taking fall damage. One of the stranger areas in this world was the green biome. I'm sure that's not what it's called, but if you go into this biome, you get a green tint on your screen. Instead of walking through the dense forest, Ethan decided to use Guard Jump to fly right over. After exploring this bizarre world, Ethan came across a familiar sight, a raid battle den. Now this was either one of the easier raid battles, or Ethan's Pokemon were actually that strong. After a long journey, Ethan was exhausted, so he decided to lay his head on a pillow only to find out the beds blow up in this world. He went back to the overworld where he could get a good night's rest, but before he did, he came across a shiny Geodude. This battle went on for a while, and when I mean a while, I mean like it literally took the whole night. And in the end, he didn't even catch it. He ended up fainting the thing. Sleep deprived and without a shiny Geodude, Ethan decided to fly again. This time coming across what looked like a Pokemon tower. Could this have been a graveyard for fallen Pokemon? Thankfully it wasn't. It was a type of Pokemon dojo. Ethan had no interest in battling them. All he would do was walk right past him, heading straight for the stairs and advancing to the next level. At the top floor, he was greeted by an old man known as the Mover Learner. When he right-clicked the man, he had to pick a Pokemon. After picking his Pokemon, Ethan discovered that he had hit the jackpot yet again, finding a man who could teach Pokemon old moves they could have already learned. Ethan went through each Pokemon, hoping to find a good move that could replace something that they currently had in their move sets. If you're still a little confused, think of it this way. If you have a bad move, you can trade it for a good move. And the best part about this whole process? It was absolutely free. During a cloudy day, Ethan came across a Thunderous. Now, I don't know if Thunderous counts as a legendary Pokemon or a mythical Pokemon, and I guess there's a difference between the two, but he's one of the stronger, rarer ones, so yeah, that was an interesting find. One thing that actually surprised me was that Ethan was actually able to catch the thing. As for me, I was at a standstill. I had let multiple days go by because I was so busy researching what I could do to actually make my Pokemon stronger. I then discovered that the Pokemon actually had stats, and yes, I knew that Pokemon had stats, I played the games before, I just didn't know that Pixelmon went that in depth. I didn't want to have to do this because you know what, it makes Pokemon like a job instead of a game, but it was time to do some EV training. Now if you don't know what EV training is, it's like I said before, at the Pokemon Training Center they have areas where you can pick a specific stat to upgrade. That's what EV training is. After stat training my Pokemon for multiple days, and it would take a long time because not all of them had an XP share, many of them began to evolve, including our investment Pokemon, who was now a Tyranitar. The only problem was that there were some Pokemon that couldn't evolve any further unless I traded them. Quinton had the same dilemma. In order to work around this problem, Quinton and I decided to make trades that would be mutually beneficial for our team. I would trade and evolve his Haunter, and in exchange he would trade and evolve some of my Pokemon. The only problem was that after the trade was complete, I couldn't send it back. Why, do you, why, why does he keep doing that? Uh, you have a trade cooldown for 11 Oh No way. What the? Your Gengar is mine now. No! <laughs> You don't deserve this privilege, that is my Pokemon. <laughs> it looked like Gengar was going to be sticking around for quite a while. One thing I forgot to mention was that I had treated Quinton my Ivysaur. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to evolve your Ivysaur. Wait, Quinton, what happened? I right-clicked to give Ivysaur a rare candy, my game instantly crashed. <laughs> Bro actually refused. Many more days had passed at the training center, and with the help of some rare candies, we were finally able to evolve our Matang into a Metagross. You're not a shiny, but... You'll do. With all of our Pokemon fully evolved and stat trained, it was time to take Quinton on once again. This was it. This was the battle that would determine who would get to fight against Ethan. The battle was in my favor because Tyranitar was able to knock out Ursaluna in the first couple of turns. Quinton chose Garchomp next. I didn't even know he had that. It was strong enough to take out Tyranitar. So Up next was Metagross. Garchomp was hanging by a thread, as was Metagross. And just my luck, Garchomp was faster. Then in a cruel act, Quinton set out our Venusaur to battle against his own family. Venusaur, if you're watching this, I'm sorry, but we had to put you down. 
After that, it was a long battle of water type versus water type, Gyarados versus Empoleon, who would come out on top? Fortunately, Gyarados was able to hang in. After that, it was time once again for Machoke to face Gyarados. Could he be redeemed from his last battle? Guess not. I then sent out Gengar, and you know what? I regret not leveling him up. I ended up having to use this low level in a battle. In the end, it was Blaziken versus Swampert, so you can guess how this battle went. I hate going to Island. I hate your Swampert so much. Why? I hate it so much. In the end, we realized that Ethan wanted to do a team battle with Ipamura versus me and Quinton. So, at least Quinton and I were going to be able to work together instead of me having to sit on the sidelines. All that was left for us to do was to continue leveling our Pokemon until it was time for the final battle. As for Ethan, well, let's just say that his team was stronger than ever. He was casually taking on tough enemies like if it was a walk in the park. When his Garchomp fought the shiny Garchomp, he was able to one-shot it, and the shiny Garchomp was level 82! Not only that, but as a reward, he got a Mega Evolution Stone. Those Mega Evolution Stones were absolutely broken, and if we were gonna battle him, then we had to rule that out. On the on chance that he did use it, there was no way we were gonna win! Our battle was drawing closer and closer, so with the little time that Ethan had left, he decided to do some more exploring, finding more desert pyramids, doing a couple of raid battles, and this was kind of strange, Ethan decided to battle Santa Claus himself! After that, he decided to check out an ocean monument, but by that point, he was all out of time. The final battle was about to begin. Every single battle that we fought was leading up to this moment. Within the battle arena waited our two greatest threats, Ethan and Ipomura. And yes, they are wearing matching uniforms. On the other side was Quinton and I wearing diamond armor. It was going to be two one-on-one -on -one battles, me versus Ethan and Quinton versus Ipomura. Who would come out on top and become the ultimate Pokemon Champion? With our opponents ready on the other side, it was time for the battle to begin. Now one thing I do want to mention was that we had to do this battle on a second server, so we did have to spawn our Pokemon in. First, it was Quinton and Ipamura. Within seconds, Quinton's first Pokemon Aerodactyl was taken out instantly! It wasn't even a minute later where Quinton's new Jolteon was taken out as well. Thankfully, Quinton's trusty Garchomp was able to come through, but now we had to face a massive Walrus Pokemon. Quinton made a tactical choice and removed Garchomp, swapping him for Ursaluna. But even though Ursaluna was so big and tanky, it still didn't matter! The Walrus took him out without hesitation. After that, it was up to our poor little Venusaur still stuck on Quinton's team. Thankfully, Venusaur was able to prove his worth, and he ended up taking out that gross Walrus. Unfortunately, Venusaur was met with the Fire Moth, and, well, he burned to a crisp. Quinton was down to one Pokémon, his starter! But even so, as strong as he was, Swampert fell. Um, that was a slaughter. No. Those Pokémon had crack in them. <laughs> After seeing how Quinton's battle went with Ipamura, I myself was a little worried about my battle with Ethan. Enemy now turned ally, Quinton was gonna be my coach. He was gonna advise me through the battle so that hopefully we could at least come out with one victory. The final battle began. It was me versus Ethan. Oh, and if you're a little confused, Ethan and Xavier, they actually share a Minecraft account, so that's why they have the same name. The first matchup was between Metagross and Toxapex. Thankfully, Metagross was able to take out Toxapex with ease. Ethan then followed up by sending out Infernape. Metagross was at an extreme disadvantage. Quinton and I decided that the best move would be to send out Empoleon. Unfortunately, Empoleon proved to be absolutely useless. Within two turns, he was out of the game. I had to replace him with Blaziken. It was my fire starter versus Ethan's fire starter, but Infernape was way faster. After only one turn, Blaziken was down to less than half of his health. But in the end, Ethan got greedy. He used a move that damaged his own Pokemon, and in the end, Blaziken fainted, but Infernape fainted with him. After that, Metagross was once again up to bat, this time facing Gengar. But there were no good moves to use against Gengar, so we swapped it out to fight fire with fire. Gengar versus Gengar, and then Ethan put my Gengar to sleep, and then he killed it. How do you kill a ghost? Our investment Pokemon was next. We sent out Tyranitar, and with the help of his Earthquake move, Gengar was off the board. Next was Tyranitar versus Garchomp. With the power of his Earthquake move, he was able to take half of Garchomp's health in the first turn. Ethan followed up by having his Garchomp use Dig. Even though the move was super effective, Tyranitar was able to hold on, and with the help of his Earthquake move, we were finally able to take out Ethan's Garchomp. He only had a couple of Pokemon left. Next was his Alakazam. 
he the new Psychic, but he didn't realize that Psychic doesn't affect Tyranitar. I guess he didn't learn the first time because he used Psychic AGAIN! Now that there was an opening, it was time for Tyranitar to strike, and strike he did because Alakazam was out of there. It was down to one Pokemon, Toxtricity. After one turn, Tyranitar fainted because Toxtricity was faster, but come on, Tyranitar did really well. In the end, we sent out Quentin's Alakazam, another Pokemon I had traded with me to evolve, and thank god we had it! Because with one move, Toxtricity was eliminated, and in the end, Ethan was defeated. Even though I had won the battle, there were still many other battles that I didn't win, so it's safe to say that I was far from becoming the Pokemon Master. In the end, all of us tried our best, and even though there was no clear winner, even though Quinton beat me like three times, the only thing that mattered in the end was that Cobblemon came out as soon as I started this mod pack, so hopefully this search term blows up in the video. Please like and subscribe. I will see you next time.